What's happening? This is Avadon, and welcome to another episode of Beats for Breakfast. Today, I am joined by the homie RGT85. Thank you so much for coming on, dude. What up, man? Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Most definitely, man. Most definitely. Um, definitely had to have you on because um, this... I've noticed a few things. You, you tweet a lot about music sometimes. Outside of video games or wrestling, I've noticed you tweet a lot about music. I just say, you know what? I have to at least have you on one of these episodes. Especially, um, it was funny when I tweeted something to say Sony took a big L, took big, something about big L. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I, I retweeted, I'm thinking like, it was like in the morning, I'm like, wait a second. Big L's not alive anymore. And you, no, he's not. And you felt the same. You, it was cool that you felt the same reaction because you you have a lot of respect for Big L, which is something that I don't see often. Oh, yeah. I, I love Big L. I love Big L. Yeah, his amazing. His highly underrated. If I feel the people, if like when you only people that know, if you know, you know. Before we talk about a little bit with music, we have a similar. Um, similar um upbringing when it comes to video games i did get the super nintendo when i was younger but i started off with sega genesis for a very long time and yeah. actually my first video games were quack shot and hyperstone heights okay so i it's like I, I could appreciate you know seeing um for video games but sega ushered in a lot of games that we grew up playing such as like streets of rage shinobi whole bunch of other games like final fight well, Final Fight, well, not really um, Sega, but more so Streets of Rage and Shinobi. Do you think with Streets of Rage 4 coming out, do you think that we could see possibly a good Shinobi game? Not what we got on PlayStation 2. <laughs> That's tough. Because <laughs> it, it, Shinobi, Shinobi, it, and the thing of it is, is like ninja games are popular nowadays. Mm -hmm. So you would think that they would want to sort of expand upon that. And even like ninja related stuff is going outside into other genres and stuff like that. Uh, you know, the, the one on the 3DS wasn't terrible. Um, mm -hmm. And that was the last, I believe that was the last built from the ground up shinobi game but i don't know shinobi's just kind of one of those franchises it's like what do you do with it do you do it like a classic style game do you make it more of a bayonetta style game it's kind of tough and you know ninja gaiden was very popular um obviously on the nes but then you know with the xbox and you know it sort of, sort of saw a resurgence but then it kind of just fizzled out so I don't know. I, I think there's definitely a market for games like that. How big the market is and how big of a production you want to make it. Do you want to make it something smaller like Streets of Rage or do you want to make it a big AAA title? I think that's where the risk comes in. I guess Shinobi had was a little bit more power based than Ninja Gaiden because you had like the fire you could bring. You had a lot of elemental right. aspects you could bring to it. I feel like it would be like a good, a good Bayonetta game if they could bring that in. So. I think they could do it, honestly. It, it would be worth the risk to see what you can do. It's all about how you present it and how you market it, in my opinion. Yeah, for sure. I mean, th like I said, there's definitely a market for it. And I think if you, honestly, I think if it was, this might be weird to say, but I think if it was an exclusive on a platform, I actually think it would do better than if it was just a multi-plat release. Because, you know, if it's an exclusive, the whatever company has it as an exclusive would obviously want the game to succeed more so than just, you know, relying on a third party developer for the game to succeed. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I, I mean, I would like to see it, but I, I, Shinobi just seems like one of those franchises like Shining Force where Sega is just like, nah, whatever. So curious, would you say which platform do you see it being most successful on? Depends on style of game it is. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think. You know, I'll always say, I'll, I'd probably say the Switch or whatever Nintendo system is out there just because it has that lineage of retro games. And I don't necessarily think that a PS5 or Xbox Series X crowd would care quite as much, you right. know. But then again, I mean, Bayonetta got popular on the Switch and then everyone wants Bayonetta to be multi-plat. So it really just, it really just depends. Like if it's that big AAA experience and maybe it would be better off suited to something like the PlayStation 5. I think Sony could do something very interesting with it, but I think it would be a lot more cinema based than necessarily gameplay based just because, you know, Sony likes those more cinema like experiences for a lot of their first party games. And then Microsoft, who the hell knows what they're doing. I agree. Like if you look at games like Ghost of Tsushima and stuff like that, it's I get I get the same vibes that it could still work on that. So I could see PlayStation Five be a, a better um, 
a better market, especially if you think internationally, because Xbox doesn't have a strong base in other in everywhere else. Like PlayStation may have a stronger base in Japan, so yeah, I can definitely sh- see that. Shinobi is popular, or you know, somewhat popular in Japan, so. I think that would be, I, I, you know, either the PS5 or the Switch or whatever Nintendo consoles out there. I don't think it would be a very big success on a Microsoft system. But then again, I mean, you know, Ninja Gaiden, you know, those games were on the original Xbox and they were some of the best games on that platform. So who knows? I, really? lo- I love the Sigma games. The Sigma games were amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So, but um, one thing about the Super NES and the Sega Genesis that I actually wanted your opinion on. The third party games often had like the same soundtracks, but the quality of the soundtracks were vastly different. And it's, I hear a lot of people just choose between, I hear a lot of people who go on the Super Nintendo side. I hear a lot of people say they like the Sega games better, um, soundtracks better. I'm more so in the middle. Yeah. And I'm cu- kind of curious on where you are with this. I take it on a game to game basis. That's right. <laughs> because I think some I think some Genesis games sound better and I think some Super Nintendo games sound better. And plus it also sort of ties into nostalgia. Like I know Cool Spot, you know, I prefer the Sega Genesis soundtrack. Some people prefer the Super Nintendo. Same sort of thing with Earthworm Jim. I think Earthworm Jim's a little bit more widely receptive that the Genesis soundtrack was better, but it was just, you know, the the Genesis did sounds differently than the Super Nintendo did, and it was it was night and day. Super Nintendo tried to sound more, I guess, realistic would be the word, while as the Genesis was more, it sounded more like a video game, if that sort of makes any sense, just, makes because, sense. Of, just because of how the bass and stuff was handled and the synthesizers were handling it. So, yeah, it's really, it's really a case-by-case basis to me. More so than not, I prefer the Sega Genesis soundtracks, but that's also a bit of nostalgia tied into it. I could agree with that because um, I'll give you a perfect example to what you just said, Maximum Carnage. Maximum Carnage, you could tell the electric guitars, the bass and the synthesizers sound very realistic and have they have way more presence on them on the Super NES than they do the Sega Genesis. But games like, I would say easily, like the Earthworm Gym games or even um, Mortal Kombat 2, I'll even say. Yeah. I prefer on Sega Genesis than I do the Super NES. So yeah. I could definitely see it's a for me it's the same thing. It's a game by game basis where it definitely depends on what game you're actually playing. But um I think what really ties into that, like you said, what a for a game by game basis, it also depends on it also depends on like the story of the game as well and what actually fits because even though Maximum Carnage it did have better quality music. I feel like in some instances it took away from it being a game in some instances. Like the soup like when I was playing um Maximum Carnage on the Genesis, which is gonna be nostalgic, I got it first on Genesis. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it it felt I feel like the story for instance, the storyboard interlude, it felt more it felt more sinister. It felt like I was reading and actually into the comic. Right. Whereas playing on Super NES, it felt like it didn't match. It sounded good. It just didn't match the visuals as much. It sounded like it should have been on something with higher res graphics. In just my own opinion. Yeah, and I, I could see that. I mean, you know, it's just it's just a different sound chip that yeah. developers use differently. So it it the results varied. Like you know, there was a lot more. Um, a lot of Super Nintendo games had kind of that hollow sound to it. Like there was a mm-hmm. almost like an echo to it. And while the instruments might have sounded better, I don't know. It was like almost too much reverb a lot of times on Super Nintendo games. And then Genesis games almost had like too much gain on it. And Way it was too like, much. because some, like, you could take the probably the worst sounding Super Nintendo game and the worst sounding Sega Genesis game, and the Sega Genesis will sound a million times worse just because like some of those games, like like Shaq Fu, like play Shaq My Fu God. On the Genesis, <laughs> and like it just sounds like random garbled sounds. I mean, it's, granted, it doesn't sound much better on the Super Nintendo, but there's a little better clarity to it whereas on the genesis it's just like a bunch of fart noises and hi-hats and stuff it's I, really strange i feel like the mixing on on some of the genesis games was horrible i think the, the one of the best sounding genesis games i will say will probably be vector man vector yes. man Ve- vector man probably had one of the best sound wait let me let me rephrase that vector man and sonic 3 sonic 3 those are like the top two for me oh I yeah even, I, mean, I even say sonic 2 sonic 2 as well 
I mean, really, you could say all the Sonic games. Really Sonic, Sonic 3 tends to stand out because of uh, the special Michael Jackson <laughs> yeah. influence that some people think still wasn't a real thing, and that's kind of like... It's pretty obvious. <laughs> it's pretty obvious, and the fact that that game has never been re-released since he passed away should be the biggest red flag of it all. Like Really? It, it wasn't even on the Genesis Mini. And it's it was not. like, well, why, why is Sonic 3 on there? It's because of Michael Jackson's passing. Like, it's tied up in his estate. That's, it, I don't know. I don't know why people don't want to believe that. But it, you could even look on cell phone games. Like, Sega has a whole list of games on cell phones. And it's like, you could get everything from Sonic 1, Sonic 2, Sonic 4. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no Sonic 3, but you get Sonic 4. You can also get um a whole bunch of um other games from sega but you can't get sonic 3 even when they made sonic mania it's like they had to get someone to redo the original tracks like that 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 was somebody who had their dog their their music program remade the original track and then remixed the second um track the on with their own flavor which i actually like for for sonic mania oh i love sonic mania so great job with that but um, what I do want to talk about before we go to our first break is your Sega 32X book. What started that? Because that was a fantastic idea. If you guys haven't gotten it, you need to get your you need to get your book. Appreciate my, it. Appreciate my 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 green screen is not not allowed us to be great right now. But you guys need to go ahead and cop this. This is a fantastic book. Um, I actually like the the memories testimony the most out of this because it really it was relatable and. I actually have a 32X unopened. Oh, we, wow. We got it for, um, my aunt got it for my brother for, I think it was a, many birthdays or Christmas ago, but it was around the same time, I think, we got uh, the N64. So it was never opened, and we got Spider-Man, I think it was Web of Fire, that was the game. Yeah, do you still have that? Yeah, I do. You, you know that's worth a lot of money, right? <laughs> yeah, I do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's why it's not open. That's... Oh, wait. You have an unopened copy of that? Unopened. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> unopened. Wow. That's that's sealed away, sealed away. Yo, that, that's worth a lot of money. <laughs> that's sealed away. Web of Fire, it's like we, we, enjoyed, we enjoyed the game, but we never got a chance to enjoy the um sega 32x we had a sega cd and mm. the sega cd we had sonic cd and i believe we have virtual fighter and also um what was that game called i forgot it's a very long name but it's willie beamish that was oh, okay yeah, yeah 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 those were the games we have in the sega cd but does we never owned a sega saturn though our cousins did but yeah so my question to you is what brought that book along though because that was a fantastic book i that that was that was nostalgia right there I literally woke up one day and was like, I think I'm going to write a book on the 32X. And like, that was it. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's the only system I it's the only system I have a complete collection for. And I completed the collection, I don't know, probably a year or so before doing the book. But I thought, you know, nobody's ever talked about this system. It's such a weird system. I like it. Mm-hmm. I have everything for it. Why not? Why not do a book on it? So yeah, I just decided that I was gonna do it. And I got up with my buddy Jason and like I showed him a very early prototype and he was like, this looks absolutely horrible. Now I was like, yeah, yeah, it does. And he was like, well, here, I have some design software. I'll design the book if you just write it and then I'll plug everything in. And I was like, okay. And then, yeah, it went from just a a weird little thing to a a full on, full fledged book. But yeah, I mean, it was literally like I just woke up one day and decided to do it because I'm a very impulsive individual. No, that happens. I, I get it. And I get that a lot. Um, There's times where I, I had that a lot with some, some of my ideas. So I, I get it. It just happens. Like going on camera, I just say, you know what? I just want to go on camera and do YouTube. I bought a better mic, got a camera, turned it on. I just said... Or I just said, you know what, I feel like just taking pictures. And I got a regular DSLR camera and just started photo- taking random pictures. So I mean, that's really the way to do it, though. Because yeah. if, you, if, if you want to do something, the, the, I find that the more you think about it, the more you, um, I don't know, the more you start to 
maybe doubt the idea or come up with i mean like we before we got on air um we were talking about like what i did today and i was i tried to film a video like three or four times it was a simple video it was on the the paper mario and metroid rumors and i was like yeah i think i'm gonna do this today and then like i just kind of sat on the idea for a little bit and then by the time i got around to filming it it was just like eh. like i don't feel like doing this i don't i don't know i've something something feels off about it but you know like the book is the same sort of thing as with my videos like people are like oh do you plan out your stuff and i'm like no not really i just kind of wake up and i'm like what do i feel like doing today and like that's that's pretty much what i base it on pretty pretty much all aspects of life that's actually a gift to just do it that, that takes in a in a way that takes a good degree of discipline though because a lot of people will have the idea and just let it pass by to actually act on the idea shows a lot of good discipline because there's plenty of times where i'll say you know what i want to do a video. well no let me let me stop there because the times i do want to do different videos i'm unable to i'm literally at a different place where i can't record the way i would want to right so but so i get it i get it but we want you guys to go ahead and check out the link down below i will have a link in the description down below for you to go ahead and ch check out the book and if you need want to go ahead and support the brother right here, please go ahead and purchase the book. It is an amazing book if you are into the lore and the history and just a complete guide of different games for the 32X. But we will go to our first break and we will have a video here from RDT85. Stay tuned. So the latest and greatest game coming to us from Nintendo for the Nintendo Switch is of course Ring Fit Adventure, a pseudo fitness game disguised as an action RPG. I don't know, this game looks really weird. We of course got some initial trailers for it and it just looked like something that I really wouldn't be interested in. And like fitness is fine if you wanna do stuff like that, but mixing fitness and video games, I don't know, it just never really seems to work for me. But I figured you guys would want my impressions on it, but I really didn't wanna give you guys my impressions on it. So I decided to hire one of my friends to come do and I like to do cameos on the channel from time to time. So I've instilled my friend Beetlejuice to come and unbox and review Ring Fit Adventure for you guys and give you guys the inside scoop on what this game is all about. Obviously, it's the spooky season. Halloween is right around the corner. So this can double as both a Halloween video and a Ring Fit Adventure video. So Beetlejuice, come on in here, buddy. Go ahead and let's introduce you to the crowd. You, you, you got to say my name three times, man. Seri seriously we're, we're, we're doing this like that's not even how it works i've watched the movie before you're already in this realm why should i have to call your name out there's no dimensional rift between the door there just open the door and come in here look man i don't make the rules i just go by them you gotta say my name three times or else i can't come in the door all right fine beetlejuice 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 it's showtime yeah, that, that's great. Great introduction. Look, I have this Ring Fit Adventure here. This is what you're going to be playing and unboxing. Just take it out of the box, pop it into the Switch over there, and just give guys your impressions about it. Hey, it's a pretty nice place you got here. A lot of cool stuff. Look at all these video games. Ooh. All right, all right, don't don't touch anything in here. Like, that's that's not why you're here. You're here to work out and get limber and enjoy Ring Fit Adventure and give people your impressions on this. Hey, man, hey, I'm, I'm not here to step on toes or anything like that, you know, buddy. I'm just, I'm very grateful for you getting me out of the world with all the sandworms and stuff. But we're going to check out Ring Fit Adventure for the Nintendo Switch. Thank you so much for letting me check out this game. And we're going to have some fun with it. And we're going to unbox it. And we're going to play it. All right, dude, that, that that's awesome. I'm going to go do some stuff in the other room. You stay in here. You have fun. And you enjoy Ring Fit Adventure. All right, welcome back everybody. We are going to talk a little bit more about music because what's Beats for Breakfast when I talk about a little bit about music, which kind of did already, but still, you're still gonna get fed more music. <laughs> <laughs> um, so earlier this month, I saw that you tweeted that you purchased an Akai MPK Mini. Yes. And I getting getting just getting that alone, I just say, oh, with the terms you was using throughout the interview and just that um that little toy by itself i have to ask do you still dabble with it since you bought it uh i've been trying to um so i used to use um i used fl studio back when it was still called fruity loops like, that, like like back in the day and um 
I used it for mixtapes, actually. Um, that's another subject, though. But I've been trying to, I've been trying to basically learn how to use this. It came with some software, and the software. Once I finally got around to figuring it out, I couldn't figure out how to layer tracks. And then I found out that the software only allows for one track at a time. Even though I swear to God, there's people on YouTube who use that same software, and they have absolutely no problem layering tracks. But everything I read says that they can't layer tracks. Everything I try, it won't. Do it, so I'm just like, all right, whatever. I'll re-download uh, FL Studio as it's known now. So I got FL Studio, and I've really just been messing around with it, trying to trying to figure out, you know, how to make it sound like I want to sound, and how to, you know, I downloaded some uh, sound packs and stuff like that. Really, I'm just in the mess around stage. I'll probably start to take it more seriously once I actually can figure out how to use everything. I got you. Um... I actually been using Fruity Loops until it became FL Studio. So I've been yeah. using F I've been using FL for about over fifteen years now. Okay. So it's I've seen like the changes it has been and everything. I could I could see where some people say, you know, I, I laugh because um, a few people were telling me it wasn't that good before and I just said that's because you guys didn't know about it or that's because you guys only heard about it. Those who used it back then till now can tell you there have been a lot of changes, but the actual foreground of the, of the program hasn't changed. Like, how do you make yeah. beats in the program? It's still the same way as it was back in 05 for me. Yeah, <laughs> there's just a lot more. There's a lot more you can do with it now because yeah. like I used it. Let's see. I was 20. So that was 14 years ago mm -hmm. is when I first started using it to make, I made chopped and screwed mixtapes. And like, that's, that's what I would use. I would use Fruity Loops to make my chopped and screwed mixtapes. And there's, uh, yeah, it yeah. was fun. <laughs> no, I, I said, so, listen, but you, you could do, you could do a lot because what I did was I would, the first samples that I would do would be, um, MIDI samples. So I would take old video game MIDI samples and plug them into the system and just change the tempo around them, change yeah. different instruments. I remember the first few samples that I did that people liked. I sampled stuff like Castlevania, Streets of Rage, Sonic, and turned them into hip hop beats. Yeah. Just started layering my own drums over it. And it, would, it, it was fun because everything was on beat. But then that's when I started learning how to um, MP3 sample and just taking the MP3 and chopping that up. And I'm life has not been the same since. I'll just say that. I'll, I'll just say I'll just say that much. It's you. You learn that MIDI sampling has its place, but it's it. One of my favorite producers. I think I'm gonna pose this question to you. One of my favorite producers of all time is Knife Wonder. And outside of Knife Wonder, um, this producer passed away unfortunately. But Jay Dilla. Okay. And those were my two top producers that got me really solidified into making music and just hearing what you know when seeing what knife would do with fl studio it just convinced me like you cannot call this a toy when you hear um threats from the black album from jay-z and knowing that was made off fl studio it's like you could do a lot with this it's like you oh, yeah. got you got to just know how to use it so I definitely had um, my my good times with the program, but what were some of your favorite producers when it came to um, music? DJ Paul. DJ Paul's wow. probably my all time favorite producer. Wow. And it's it's crazy because that style has you know uh, the original DJ Paul style, like even before mm -hmm. back when when Three Six Mafia was Triple Six Mafia. Mm -hmm. That sort of you know evil. Almost, I guess now the, the kids say it's emo sounding um, stuff, but like that stuff that was popular, you know, in Memphis in 92, 93, when it was underground is now like one of the main sounds in hip hop. And it's like, nobody ever says like, oh, thanks DJ Paul. And you know, for, for creating that. That's, sound. that, that's, that is, that's a good pick by the way, with his, now he was definitely unique with his sound. Um, Wow, I've not heard people say that. Like that is a really good unique pick. I mean, I was I was a huge I still am. Uh I was a huge 36 Mafia fan growing up. Like gotcha. I I would go I I remember um back when you used to have to buy CDs, um when the Unbreakables came out, me and my buddy 
both went up to the local Sam Goody, which was a store that sold like music and movies and games. And uh, we both waited outside for them to open so that we could go and get the Three Six Mafia album. We were like the only two people in our whole town that cared about it. But yeah, like Three Six Mafia, like I just I absolutely loved them and all the side projects. Like yeah, yeah, great, great stuff. Dope, dope, dope. It's I could say um, me growing up outside of that before Knife Wonder and before Jay Dilla, I could say I. I can't appreciate um, DJ Premier's work mm -hmm. with the with the DJ sound effects because to this day I will say Primo did it, he did get me interested in trying to master that feel of adding like the the record scratch scratch um effect with mixing old lyrics from old songs and make making it form almost a new song. It's right. Yeah, I think there's only one producer that did that in a way that was tasteful. That was um, Ski Beats when he did Dead Presidents for um, for Jay Z, and yeah. he um, sampled um, Nas the Nas joint. That was um, New York, was that New York State of Mind? It's like I'm out for presidents to represent me. That was um, I know it's not the Elmatic album. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah. But I would say when he did Dead Presidents, I was like, Ski Beach literally is doing something that a lot of people can't do. So I will definitely give credit for like East Coast, East Coast hip hop is and just just in East Coast hip hop producers like they took over the 90s. But when you say DJ Paul, it's like, dang, you're right. They did really pioneer and not even just pioneer. They literally. Um, Innovated a sound that wasn't there before, and yeah. <laughs> that's something that a lot of we don't we don't think about. Even like even like the style, like the triplet style, yeah. you know, uh, that Migos uses, like that that was a Lord Infamous thing. Like that was <laughs> that was his style. That was how he spit. So you know, it, it's 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 cool to see it, you know, evolve into that. But mm -hmm. you know, many of the many of the young bucks, they don't really realize like where that sound originated from. I guess it doesn't matter to them at the end of the day. It, you know? it more than likely doesn't matter, and I I can't say that I blame them because it's like for me for me it's like when I first started listening to um, hip hop and everything, I appreciated you know Pox you know, Nas and, and everything. But when you listen to not even just Nas, but a lot of people in the, in the early 90s, you got to give respect to Rakim, who really cultivated that style. Exactly. So I would definitely, because before Rakim, most rappers would just yell into the mic. Rakim really came in like the smooth delivery. And that's where most people started following up behind him in that same formula. But um, in terms of... um other music what, what were some of your other music influences Cause i know you, you used to dab with the guitar too and everything right oh yeah i still play guitar i've been playing nice. guitar for 20 years now i guess so i'm really weird and like if you if i have my amazon fire hooked up in my car through the auxiliary port and it'll literally go from like whitney houston to death metal to dmx to uh, Suicide Boys to Frank Sinatra, and re literally everything but modern pop and country. I, I can't, I can't do country. I, it, country just, and I lived in the South for twenty plus years, and it was just, I, I don't get it. Like I don't understand country music, like at all. And if if you're watching the show and you're a fan of country, congrats. But yeah, like every song just sounds the same to me and like i know people say that about rap too uh but yeah just like i can i couldn't get down with country but literally everything else you know michael jackson uh michael bolton phil collins freestyle music i listen to a lot of freestyle music i don't know i i think it was because growing up like my dad used to listen to a lot of freestyle music okay and so like i sort of picked up on it there and then my stepdad used to like uh, more hip hop and stuff like that because he actually used to DJ in Brooklyn and then my mom just listened to random bubblegum crap so like that's just how it sort of all blended together and then I discovered um, stuff like metal uh, growing up in you know uh, middle school and stuff like that I remember my dad's younger brother came down 
um, to visit us, and uh, he had um, Wu Tang Forever, and that was the first time I'd ever heard uh, a Wu Tang. And I was like, oh, well, I like this. I need to know about this. And so then I started getting into rap and stuff like that. So I, I'm very, I'm very all over the place with my music. Um, I'm almost the same way. Back when I used to have um, an MP3 player before I had my phone, especially my new phone. My new phone now is like, I don't really have much of albums on here. But when I was heavily more into sampling, you would hear anything from me from listening to uh dmx you would hear nas then you would sometimes hear the alan parsons project then you would even hear um me listening to uh john coltrane you will hear miles davis and you will end up hearing whitney houston then you end up hearing um um george benson even then you yeah. <laughs> then you even end up hearing me listening to um, Michael Jackson, of course. Sometimes you hear some Prince in there. Then you hear So For Real. Then I would play um, Frank Sinatra. Um, then it, it's like I had a whole wide range of music, even the Eagles. Like I would listen to pretty much anything that sounded good. And like you, I didn't really get too much into country. The only times I would probably dabble into country i forgot it was this one song that i think i sampled and it was because i heard it in a way where i said i wonder how it'll sound like this and what i did was i forgot the, tr the track i sampled um but i just took the um the sample and i just sped up the sample really fast uh -huh. and it gave a brand new sound and i said I could use this. <laughs> I yeah. can I could use this. It was like an old Western country song. Like it was almost like a I, I took it from like a Western movie, but it was like a Western country song. And I just said, I can use this. So those like the only times I'll probably listen to countries because sometimes it's weird. My ear will hear something and I'll I can actually hear it in a different octave while it's playing. And I'm like, hmm, maybe I could do something with that. That's how half my video game samples happen and almost every other thing. So I could definitely agree. It's like having, I will say having a different type of ear is going to really help with music. If you're into sampling as well, it's definitely going to help with music as well because you hear things differently. Yeah, for sure. Like even, even like playing video games, like I noticed different sorts of things within the music that probably some people wouldn't you know, appreciate or, or hear or anything like that. So yeah, one of my goals this year, my my goal is with this um with this pad is to actually make a synth wave album. So that's kind of why I've been trying to mess around with that. Cause even though it's very popular now, like I was into it probably eight or nine years ago. You know, back when I used to DJ, mm -hmm. um I would try to incorporate well, I would try to I would start out with a lot of you know, synth wave and Euro trash style dance music. Mm -hmm. But most of the time the bars would let me drink for free. And it was me and my buddy. And we would, we would basically just take turns. Like I would mix for a half hour. He would mix for a half hour. So like that first half hour, like you got some actual decent stuff. And then like, as I would start to drink more, it really, I just wanted to, you know, like ruin the club we were in. So I would throw on like Pastor Troy and Lil Scrappy and, and DMX and 3-6 Mafia and stuff and just start belligerently screaming into the microphone and trying to start fights. Cause yeah, I guess that was kind of one of the things I would do. I don't know. I just I wanted mean, to spice things up a little bit and, you know, try to try to you this, know make the club, you know, go crazy. I tell people this all the time. DMX had the most weirdest party songs of all time yeah i listened to some of some of his lyrics and i'm like this is a party song like to this day get it on the floor by dmx will always confuse me you listen to yeah. the lyrics <laughs> it's a party song but if you listen to the lyrics i'm like wait people are dancing to this it's like he's talking about chainsawing dudes and it's, yeah. like, <laughs> it's 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 crazy so i i get what you're saying it's like there's different music that could definitely cause people to um to, that could cause fights and three six mafia music was known for that sometimes too so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was known for that it, it was it was well known for that so i definitely understand where you're coming from 
But guys, we're going to go ahead and take another quick commercial break. We'll be back and for another set of questions. And make sure you guys are subscribed to RGC85 if you're not already. <laughs> So late last night, the latest Nintendo financial report went out that details things like Nintendo Switch sales and Nintendo Switch software sales. And a lot of people were wondering, well, how is the Nintendo Switch doing? How did the Nintendo Switch do in the last quarter of 2019? What are game sales looking like? And what is the future of the system? Well, we got a bunch of details and I basically just wanna go over this information with you guys. I'm RGT85. If this is your first time on the channel, make sure you hit that subscribe button. And without any further ado, let's jump into Nintendo Nintendo's latest financial report and talk about how the Nintendo Switch sales are just literally on fire. So kicking things off, we got an update on the Nintendo Switch hardware sales for life to date. Now, of course, the Nintendo Switch will be turning three in the month of March. Too. So a lot of people were wondering, well, how is the system doing? How is the system doing in comparison to the competition and in comparison to other Nintendo systems? Well, the latest number for the Nintendo Switch in worldwide sales comes in at 52.48 million units sold worldwide. So roughly 52.5 million sold worldwide. And and that of course is a very large number the nintendo switch now has officially surpassed the xbox one and the xbox one family of systems in total sales worldwide when it comes to hardware numbers now obviously microsoft is going in a bit of a slightly different direction with things like game pass but to see the nintendo switch doing so well especially after the failures of the wii u is just an astronomical thing to see now you gotta remember the nintendo 3ds only sold about 75 million units worldwide so this system, the Nintendo Switch, is definitely on pace to surpass the Nintendo 3DS and the Nintendo 3DS family of systems, which is crazy. Welcome back. And I have to um, ask you one question when it comes to like gaming music as of today. Now, we both grew up playing like Super NES and Genesis games. What is your take on gaming music as of today? Is it, does it still retain like the the soul aspect of gaming, like of nostalgia of, of games that you think you remember like years from now? Like I could remember like Toe Jam and Earl soundtracks more than I can remember a lot of rec these recent game soundtracks. Is it the same for you? Yeah, I think a lot of the recent games that I've played it's just the, the soundtracks just haven't been as memorable. I think Astral Chain did a really good Definitely. job on the soundtrack. Um, Luigi's Mansion, there were some there were some good so I mean there were some questionable songs, but there were some good songs in Luigi's Mansion. Uh, Ease Eight actually, I like I liked a lot of the songs in that game too. But it's just kind of like it seems a lot more few and far between, and that could just be because I don't know when you're a kid you tend to notice everything every little aspect about everything because mm -hmm. you know when you get a game like that's the game you got that's the game you have to enjoy that's the game you have to look forward to for the foreseeable future until your parents decide to buy you something else whereas when you're an adult like it seems like you siphon through games a lot more so i think i think it's i think it's not as prevalent as it once was but that could just be you know because of getting older like kids probably freak out over you know Fortnite sounds and so you know the Fortnite menu music or something like that so who knows yeah definitely i i agree because i i think back to playing a lot of the games that i even got on the switch i'll say from the switch era of games which is really where i came back more so in the game i came back late wii u to switch and i would say games like sonic mania are very memorable to me yeah. It, is, it has that old classic retro feel versus even though I like this game so much, I loved Monster Boy so much, I have trouble remembering some of the tracks. Yeah. Like, and I love that soundtrack. That soundtrack was really good, but maybe I could remember like one or two, but I don't remember that soundtrack very well or games like... Um, well, even like Super Mario Odyssey. I was just going to say that. <laughs> like I, I there's one song I remember the new Donk City song because you know that was that was the big song from the game but everything yeah. else it's like you don't remember it yet if you think about the old Mario games the NES the Super Nintendo era the N64 era like those soundtracks were just a lot more memorable like I could remember all of those songs off the top of my head whereas 
with Odyssey, it's like, you know, you kind of forget about them. Even um, games like, you said Super Mario um, Odyssey, I still remember the intro to Super Mario RPG. And yeah. not only that, but almost every song of Super Mario RPG, I still remember those songs. Like if you played the soundtracks, I could tell you where it was, what level and everything. And yes, yeah, an RPG, but I only owned that RPG once. That was the one game that I lost when we, our house had a fire. Like there was two games that I lost, Mario RPG and Pokemon Blue. I was very Damn. upset. Yeah. <laughs> I was very upset, but um, growing up and playing, even playing, um, you know, playing the ROMs or playing it over on the Wii U again, I would say like games like Super Mario RPG literally they literally had a nostalgia feel. Even games like Zelda, um, Ocarina of Time, Majora's Mask. Shoot, I even go into Final Fantasy VII, Final Fantasy VIII, Final Fantasy yeah. IX. A lot of these games had memorable songs. And I just feel like a lot of these games today don't have the same value. Um, speaking of just memorable songs and speaking of Final Fantasy VII, it's... I'm thoroughly surprised that the remake song so far is outclassing the original. Yeah, it seems like <laughs> it seems like they are doing a lot with that soundtrack. Yeah, I was pleasantly surprised because usually when they do remakes, the soundtracks really don't sell me too much. Right. It, yeah. it, it's just it feels like it's the same thing just in higher res, but I feel I'm noticing um different chord progressions i'm noticing different instruments i'm noticing um different arrangements and even the iconic boss battle theme for final fantasy 7 where you fighting when i looked on the demo when you fighting the scorpion i'm like wait a second i didn't notice it was the the old boss music until i heard it deeply i'm like wait a second this is the old boss music and it sounded just better and cleaner so i guess that's another reason why i'm really p pumped for that game is because the soundtrack the soundtrack along with the gameplay looked like it's going to be just amazing all the oh, way yeah. around oh yeah for sure that game's going to be super awesome i'm curious to see how long it'll end up being though i i have a theory i, I know i know that game is going to be as long as midgar which with what they're doing with, with what they've shown for midgar um I, I think I talked about this with Nick. I would give it about 25, 30 hours. Yeah, I think that's fair. I, was, I, I, I feel like they're going to add a lot of stuff into it, too. Make to, it 60. Yeah. Well, I mean, not even necessarily that. Just sort of give you more things to do in Midgar and just add sort of new content. It's not Because it's obviously not a, a complete one-to-one -one sort of remake with just a new engine. Like, they've changed a lot of things, so... It's, it's like I said this to everybody. I said this is not your day to day remake. This is a reimagining in a yeah. sense because they're redoing everything from how you play to the scripts to the areas you interact with to even how you fight your boss battles. The boss battles look like they could take a little bit longer than usual, and you can't. It's it's value for the newcomer and it's value for the veteran player. The veteran player just can't jump into this and think that he can use the same tactics as he used playing the regular game. Right. And that's what I like about it. That's what I like most about it. Um, I even like um, when I was watching the demo, the banter between Cloud and Barrett during the fight. To me, yeah. that adds... To me, that adds more fun to play the game. That makes me want to actually play this. So my theory is, though they may end Midgar on April 10th when they release it, I have a theory that they're going to release the next part of the game holiday season. You they, think so? I want to say I want to say holiday season. That's just my that's just my personal theory, because I know they're going to they know Midgar is not enough. It's not satisfying to everyone, especially releasing it in this early part of the year. But I feel like they're already working on part two and probably nearly done with, with releasing part two. And probably during E3, they'll drop the ball on us and say you could play the next portion of Final Fantasy VII Remake this holiday season. You think they'll charge 60 for it as well, though? It depends on the content, actually, because if you're playing, if they let you, if they start you off in the open world and it's kind of like Final Fantasy 15 and you could travel between the different towns and it goes up to Eris's death or I would say not even just so much Eris's death, it goes up into 
uh, for so those of you who never played Final Fantasy VII, sorry for the spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if it goes up into when Cloud gets drawn into the life stream, which I feel like will be a better portion to cut the game at. Yeah. I feel as though that's still worth 60 bucks. That's a lot of content in between. If you really think about how much happens in between, and they still pay as much detail um, attention as they did Midgar, and they apply the same thing to the overworld, I think that's worth 60 bucks as well. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's really what it boils down to is just how much content they're going to be able to get out of it. And I think how long it's going to take for everything to complete, because I, I don't want to see it take something like, you know, five or six years and, you know, you end up with a Shenmue situation where you you got the third game coming out, you know, 20, nearly 20 years later, and they still haven't concluded the saga. They still haven't ended it. They still want to do more. And it's just kind of like, how long are you going to drag this out for? <laughs> like, at I, some point in time, you have to say, all right, enough's enough. You know, we ran out of time. Roll the credits. This is what happened. I feel as though that's what they want to do. I think that was the biggest hesitation with this remake because it was their own fault for showing the tech demo with the PS3 because that yeah. got it people talking. And it was their own fault again with having that bonus scene in Dirge of Cerberus, which opened a new can of worms. And it was their, their own fault yet again with Crisis Core, with how you ended Crisis Core. Yeah. They, they literally said to be continued in Final Fantasy VII. And it's like, how do you go from playing Dirge of Cerberus to the original Final Fantasy VII for a lot of people? Like, some people could do it, but for the newcomer, they may not want to go to go ahead and do that. Right. So that's why I feel as though I do agree that they're looking at how can they fully close the door and end this series. And that's why I believe there may be three, at the very most, not even three, but three parts with uh, ex an expansion side story, which would be about 30 bucks. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that would that would be fine, I think. Yeah, because you could, the third, the third disc could be, I mean, the third game could be uh, getting Cloud's memory back, the final face-off in Shin, in, with Shinra, and the final face-off with Sephiroth. I feel like they could do all of that within the third disc, and they could make Advent Children and the events, the uh, one event after Advent Children playable by DLC content, like an expansion pass. And no. yet, but oh no, I was just gonna say yeah. I mean that that would make sense for them to do. I would be interested to see how well like the first release sells versus like the second and third release though to see if people actually stick around for it or if they just sort of abandon it because they want a more complete experience because it almost seems like to me it seems it seems like almost fan service with a nostalgia based audience but if you drag it on too long i feel like you might lose that nostalgia based audience so Definitely. i hope that they wrap things up you know in in two or three years from the i would say two years i think would be good from the original release of the, the first disc. But then again, you got, you know, Smash Brothers released in one year. You know, it, yeah, it's been a year and now they're continuing it till 2021 with the DLC packs till December 2021. So it's like, you know, these companies are starting to stretch out these these games a lot more. Obviously, it's a little bit different, but, you know, still, if you want the more content, if you want to continue to play it, you got to pay to play. Yeah. And I would say. I, I told I told people it's like I'm not surprised because they wanted this game to look the best way it can for them to for it to have it look like this you you was not gonna have this game come out in, on one disc by itself right. yeah for sure it's 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 too much it's too much going on it's like you could play this game in 4K in 4K 30 I believe so it's with HDR I looked at the, some of the demos with 4K 30 HDR and it's it's amazing but. I would say considering all that, this is gonna be something that if you look at Midgar, let's let's just look at Midgar by itself 
and then you look at the fact that they're going to like expand upon like, upon Midgar and go in, open up different parts of the story. I feel if they tell the story of Midgar well enough, where it doesn't end the way it does on Final Fantasy VII, then it could get away with it. If you yeah. give people a good experience and make people feel like they got a good game, because if I'm thinking if they end Midgar the way I believe or how I played Midgar, that motorcycle escape and the boss on the bridge, that's kind of, uh, in my opinion, a very lazy way to end it. But if they decide to end the first disc, not there, but they end the first disc uh, at the cloud tells the story of Sephiroth, that's actually pretty a pretty decent place to end the first disc. I think that I think it'll be the I think it'll be the bike scene. Yeah, the bike scene is. I don't even think you'll get the boss at the end. I think it'll literally just be the bike scene, and then when you jump into the second game, that's where it starts out. And then my concern, my only concern is, do they transfer like your your file over? Do these do these games like are these separate games? Do you start off like level one in the second game? Do these games like travel over, or do you have like a level cap that you hit, kind of like in the Doc Hat series or the PS2? We had a level cap for each game. That that's very interesting to think about. It's like these are things that I'm thinking about. Like, do you does your level carry over, or do you have to? I would think your level would carry over if you played the first game and if you if you just got in at the second game, you just get in on a base level where like whatever Squeenix thinks you should be around in order to be presentable yeah. in the game. But that is an interesting question. I haven't even thought of that. Cause these are things that I'm thinking about, but um all in all, I feel it's gonna be successful either way. I just feel bad in April because there's so many games come out in April and the other game that's coming out in April that I am fully invested in and interested in is Trials of Mana. Yes. Because Sega Dead Setsu 3 was my favorite Super Nintendo game. I know a lot of people prefer, prefer Chrono Trigger. Mine was always Sega Dead Setsu 3. And seeing that being remade is, that's what I'm excited for. Yeah, that's going to be an awesome game. It's, it's a really good year so far for games, and there's still so many questions going into the year as well. You know, what is, what's going to be available on the PS5 on day one? What is Nintendo doing with the Switch? Because they've only, there's only three games announced that are first party games that we know about so far. So I think it's going to be an interesting year. I believe so too. Uh, with the PS. My, my question to you is, and I want to pose this, I asked this on the show cast, I just want to get your thoughts on this. With the PS5 and them not showing up to E3, do you think it really matters in this day and age? In 2020, mm. this is like, now in 2020, do you think it matters? I think it's strange because you would, you would think they would want to promote the system as much as possible, but you know, it, I want it to matter from a personal standpoint, but I don't I don't necessarily think it doesn't really matter anymore because there's so many different ways to get your message out there. There's so many different ways for companies to convey. I mean, look at Nintendo Directs, look at state of play events. So, you know, E3 is just more of a time-honored tradition, but at some point in time traditions change and, you know, the industry changes. So, I don't, you know, at first it was kind of stunning, but you know, the more you think about it, the more it probably does kind of make sense. Okay, so um, just last two quick questions: What is um like your most anticipated game for it for this year? Whew. Um, Doom Eternal. I'll say yeah, I'll go Doom Eternal as far as what we know is coming out. I really loved the original or Doom 2016. Uh, on the PS4, I loved it on the Switch, so Doom Eternal. Okay, my mine is Final Fantasy VII, so it's the same month, <laughs> it's the same month again. <laughs> so April is going to be a good month. But um, I actually, actually, I want to touch on one thing because I actually liked your video a lot about toxic gamers. Thank you. That was a fantastic video because it's why i haven't really spoken too much about gaming on twitter because it's like it seems like no matter what there's a giant bonfire it's yes. like you cannot be you cannot be neutral you have to pick one side or the other and 
the buy lift reveal, my response was literally I woke up, I was late to the, to the direct, I'm like, oh, scroll, looked on YouTube, see buy lift, I'm like, oh, okay. Turn my phone up, went back to sleep. <laughs> see, that, I, was, I had a friend um, come over a Wednesday night and she ended up leaving at like two or three in the morning. I was like, just stay the night. She was like, no, I gotta go get a tattoo tomorrow early. So I'm gonna drive home. And then, so I was on like five hours of sleep by the time I ended up going to sleep. But I was like, I have to wake up. I have to cover this. It's going to be good. So I rolled out of bed at 830, smoked a cigarette, splashed some water on my face. I was like, all right, here we go. Here we go. And then they showed Byleth. And I was like, I can't believe I woke up for this. <laughs> and like my video was just like I, I, my video reaction on it sucked because I was half asleep. And it was just like, I don't even know what to say. It, it was it was almost indifference towards it, you know. Yeah. It wasn't. I wasn't necessarily upset like a lot of people were. I wasn't happy like a lot of people were. I was just indifferent towards it. It's like, yeah, okay. And I like the fact that you get video pointed on both ends because it's like you touched on. Yeah, it's like you shouldn't demonize these creators. Or you shouldn't like say they're wrong for doing this or taking it far off the edge. Like, yes, you do have the right to be disappointed, disappointed, and everything because. You did put in money for for um for the for the DLC pack, and the perceived the perception was you was getting nothing but third party characters. Seeing how the proceeding re reveals were all, all third party characters, they set that pres that president up. Yeah. So I could understand the disappointment. I could understand even being a little upset, but going beyond to the point where you. Going even, like I said, you could dislike the video, but going beyond that and like almost trying to get mad at other people for being happy, that's why I feel like you're drawing the line. And the same for the other people, for the people who are constantly saying these people are wrong for doing this or wrong for doing that, they should be grateful that they're getting a character as well. No, because at, like you said, at that point, you're just promoting bad customer service and that's something that you should never do. Yeah. So I... It was a great video, and I was I was like, thank you, because it needs to be more videos about that. I'm taking the comedic side of it, because I just I want to have fun. <laughs> right. <laughs> but yeah, um, outside of that, um, I just want to know, do you have anything you want to give to any advice you want to give to any content creators? Have fun. Don't have fun and don't look at it as a biz. Don't look at it as a business unless it starts becoming a business organically. That's a misconception that so many people have about YouTube. I know a lot of people that decide I'm gonna go full time on YouTube and they just jump in head first and then they hit their head on the pool floor because it's the shallow end of the pool and then they break their neck. And it's like, you know, I didn't consider doing anything on YouTube full time until it started to sort of grow and then I just sort of watched it and I sort of analyzed it. And then once it got to a point where you can do it for more than just fun, you can do it for an actual living, then I decided to do it. But, you know, I, it's one of those things where it, it's it's not about it's not even necessarily who's the best. If it was about, you know, who's the best at, you know, creating videos and stuff, I wouldn't be doing this full time because I, I'm not the best editor. I'm not the best speaker. Sometimes, you know, I, I say things that, you know, rub people the wrong way or something. There's a lot of luck to it. And like, that's what I attribute 90% of this to is just luck. So, you know, don't get frustrated, have fun with it. If it ends up becoming something more awesome, if it never becomes, ends up becoming more like, that's okay. At least you, you know, you probably have people that value your opinion. You never know what sort of opportunities. And that's another thing. Don't ever be afraid of somebody saying no to you. If there's a game coming out and you want to get that game, hit up those PR studios. I don't care how many subs you have. I remember when the retro USB ABS came out, I had like 8,000 subs and I was like, I want this HDMI $200 plus dollar NES system and I'm going to try to get it. And I was like, the worst thing a company is going to say is no, or they're going to ignore your email. So never feel like, you know, you're not big enough to request something because uh, you know, you are, and you never know what might end up happening with that. So yeah, I kind of went all over the place with that, but not nah, you, you, you hit a lot. You gave a lot of gems because 
I feel as though a lot of us as content creators, even myself included, it's like when you start going into, into thinking this as solely as a business without having fun, you start to burn out very fast. That's why even for myself, I pivoted away from just doing gaming news. And I just said, what do I like doing? And exactly. when I focused on what I like doing and what I want to do, I started having fun. Now, of course, to my own standards, I make videos to my standards only because I want to see videos a certain way on the platform and I want to make sure I enjoy watching it, which is why I put a certain amount of quality in my videos. But outside of that, it's like you have to enjoy your videos for yourself first. That's the one thing that I've always made sure is like, enjoy your content. Like enjoy exactly. it, have fun. If you can't, if you are not enjoying your conf, your content, or you're making skits, you're not laughing at yourself or the things that you did. You probably shouldn't put it up. If you're yeah, <laughs> if you're not laughing, why would anyone else laugh? You know, if you're not enjoying it, why would anyone else enjoy it? So right. it, exactly, an example of that. My um my last video that I put on, where I got back to edited content on my main channel. I literally said, so Final Fantasy VII Remake has been delayed. And I took the scene from Half Baked, boo this man! <laughs> <laughs> right there, see? I found that funny. And just you you being familiar with the movie, oh, yeah. like, you you loved, you loved it. Everyone that I showed that preview to laughed and loved that as my intro. And I just said, that's what I want to do. Stuff that makes me laugh that I enjoy, I want to share that with people. And it comes off more genuine and organic when you do that. So exactly. focus on that and you'll be fine. So with that said, thank you so much for coming on. I really do appreciate your t you taking out time to do this. No uh, problem. We're, we're going to close out. For those of you who are not following RGT85, I'm going to remind you again to make sure you purchase this book down below. And also make sure you are subscribed to his channel. And like we always say, if you liked this episode, make sure you hit that Hold up. Rewind. <laughs> rewind. Rewind. This is the first time that's set up. If you like this video, hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. And most of all, most of all, you make sure you share this with a friend. This is Avadon and RGT85, and we are out. Peace.